we left. We last left Paul in Ephesus. Um, now this is, we're picking up. Our, this this should have been ministered on Wednesday night this past week. I was out of town, and I don't want to get behind, so we're doing it tonight. Hallelujah! But we're teaching a chronological study on the life and teachings of Paul. Um, and so what we're doing, we started with the book of Acts. We kind of did a background history, picked up where Paul showed up in the book of Acts and as Saul, and then went through his whole conversion. And, <clears throat> and then when we get to where in Acts, uh, he, he wrote a book, we stopped. And we studied that book, hallelujah, because now we had the background of where he was, what he was doing, why books were written, or epistles, uh, letters. And so we've already, and so in, in being in chronological order, the first two books Paul wrote, or letters he wrote, was, uh, first and second Thessalonians, chronologically, not, not according to the... Now, the canon order is based on uh, public and private letters, so divided public uh, or, or church and private. And so the, the letters to you know, uh, Timothy and the letters to Titus and Philemon uh, are written or are, are, are put together. The letters to the churches are put together, but they're put together in length order. In other words, the longer to the shorter, uh, starting that way. But we're doing it chronologically, date-wise. And so we're studying them in the, in the, uh, in the time frame when he wrote them. And so the first letter Paul wrote was to the church of Thessalonica. Second one was Second Thessalonians. Um, and then now he got over here to Ephesus. And Paul wrote, uh, he was getting ready to leave Ephesus. Um, <clears throat> apparently having, as we studied earlier, had, having written a letter, written a letter that is lost. But uh, he didn't like the way that letter went. He got word from them that it didn't go. So he wrote another letter. Okay, he wrote a letter back to him. Zzz, there's a bug in here. I need a laser tag. I need to laser tag him. Hallelujah. Praise God. And, um, and so Paul wrote this, what we call 1 Corinthians, probably was 2 Corinthians. And then there seems to be some evidence in 2 Corinthians that was a letter in between 1 and 2. And so there's probably four letters here. That church was a mess. Let's just say that church was a mess. And they, were, they were given over to idolatry. They were given over to their flesh. Um, they, they, uh, they just had a philosophy that was not biblical, and, um, and so Paul had to, write, had, had to do a lot of dealing with them, and they did not receive his, his correction well. You know, and let me tell you something, when you don't receive correction well, it gets you in trouble, as we said before. Now, if we'll go ahead and get over to, uh, to the map uh, of, a second, of his third and fourth mission journeys, as we said, Paul is, you know, Paul is on his third mission journey here, and uh, he had left Antioch, he's working his way around here, and he, he's, he's hung up here at Ephesus again. All right, he's sitting, he's sitting here, and uh, he's getting ready to leave Ephesus and go into Macedonia, but right now he's at Ephesus, heard some things from Corinth, wrote him a letter, all right? You know, <clears throat> I like the old um, song that the, the Joe Cocker did, my baby, she wrote me a letter. My apostle, he wrote me a letter, hallelujah, <laughs> glory to God. And so <clears throat> he's ready to go ahead down now to um, the, uh, the outline of 1 Corinthians. We already covered 1 Corinthians 1 through 5, and... Um, and in chapter 5, we, we, that's where we kind of left off. You know, Paul wrote about the fornication that was in the church, the man having his father's wife. He, he, took, he shacked that with his stepmama and came into the church and just hung out in the church. Like, <coughs> there was no problem with being in fornication and being in the church openly. And as we said this morning, when the Lord directed us to change our, ser our, our sermon uh, message this morning and go in a different direction, that unrepentant sin will bring judgment. Now, Paul said that, you know, he, he talked about there in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, how that their boasting was not good, how that when they come together, he's judged already. He was going to turn that guy over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Yet we come right on the other hand and go to um, Hebrews chapter 4 and get, find out there that if you come boldly to the throne of grace in the time of need, you'll obtain mercy and find grace. So repentant sin will find mercy and grace. Never will you find judgment if you come in repentance to God. You'll only find mercy and grace. It is the unrepentant that find judgment. And so we always want to, how many, how many want to be under mercy and grace instead of judgment? I don't want to be under judgment. Amen. Well, what, what the big thing is, you know, because that new teaching out <coughs> that we don't confess our sin, that's only for unbelievers and the church doesn't repent anymore. You see, what you're doing, you're setting people up for judgment and not for mercy. I want the mercy. Anybody here want judgment? I mean, just I ask again, does anybody want judgment? No, nobody wants judgment. All right. So let's go ahead and get into 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul finished up for chapter 5 by talking about, um, and, and, and he brought clarity in here. Let me just kind of recap. He, he, he did this, and then he said, he told you in another epistle, that's this is where we find out, 
Let's back it. Let's go into chapter 5. I'm trying to rush through it. In verse 4, 9, it says this. Um, I wrote to you in an, in an epistle. Well, that means a letter. And it's not can't be this letter because I wrote to him before. Not the company with fornicators. Yet not all together with the fornicators of this world or a covetous or extortioners with idolaters. For then must needs ye go out of the world. In other words, Paul's saying, I wasn't talking about don't be around sinners who fornicate. If you, if you do that, you're just going to have to leave the earth. 1 Corinthians 5, 9, verse 10. And then now verse 11. But now I've written unto you. In other words, I'm bringing clarity to what I said in the first letter. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortion. Let me just say something here. That's not the full list. It's just examples. In other words, if people are living outside the moral law of God, and they claim to be a Christian, don't company with them. Now, it's not that he wants you to count them as an enemy. He says in another letter, and I, I did not mean count them as an enemy, but to bring them to shame. Don't hang, you know, he went on and said, don't even eat with them. If they're living ungodly, openly and unrepentant don't eat with them don't have fellowship with them oh but i've got to love i got to be there for them i got to love them i got to support them that's not support you're you are reinforcing their actions and activities when you do that there is church discipline people don't like it don't people don't believe it now people sue if you get disciplined in the church if you get ex excommunicated people are suing for being excommunicated so churches think that, so we just need to have a letter say, if you join the church, we, we have the right to excommunicate you based on whatever opinion we have, you know. If we think you blew your nose wrong, we can kick you out. For what, I think, it says, for what have I to do to judge them that are without? Do, you not, do not ye judge them that are within? In other, words, we're to judge, in other words, the Christian church is to judge the lifestyle of the believer when they're living unrepentant. And there has to be church discipline. What for? Paul said he turns over, one over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. The judgment and the, and the, and the, uh, and the enforcement of, of, of consequences due to that judgment brought was to bring repentance and restoration so it wouldn't go to hell. Now, people say, uh, <coughs> I felt a Holy Ghost sneeze coming on. Oh, my. Hallelujah. See, people say, oh, you're not walking in love. You're being mean. to them. No, 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 no. You're trying to save them from hell. Now, a little shame or whatever on this side is a whole lot better than eternal damnation on the other. Are you here? And so church discipline is necessary when there's unrepentant sin in the church. Now, I'm going to tell you something. If you go to somebody and, they, and you say, look, you're doing wrong, you need to correct this, and they repent, there's, there's, that's it. They get mercy and grace. They say, well, I can do whatever I want to do, and I'm going to keep doing it. That's unrepentant, and then judgment has to come. See, there's, you know, and to tell, tell somebody they're doing wrong is not judgment. I, I tell you, I, just get, I get fed up with people going, you're not supporting me. You're not walking in love. You're not doing this because you told me what I was doing was wrong. Well, what you're doing is wrong. Hello? You're smoking dope and shooting heroin and, you know, getting drunk, getting high. And somebody says, that's not, oh, man, you're not walking in love. No, I am walking in love. Right. I'm trying to save you right. from destruction instead of this mess of, you got you to support me in this. I'm not going to support you in that. Then, then when I get to heaven, the Lord's going to get on my case. Hello? That went over big. All right. But then outside the church, God judges, therefore... And he goes on and says about this guy living with his mother, stepmother. Put away from you that wicked person. Verse 6. I mean, chapter 6. Dare any of you. Now, now Paul moves into the 6th chapter <clears throat> and kind of trans uh, goes over a little bit into some different things. Verses 1 through 8. He deals with the church suing each other. Hello. Glenn, you can go ahead and put that on the last slide. He, go, he, he deals with in these, in these first eight verses of this 6th chapter. He's dealing right here. Uh, last slide. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We're moving right on down. Hallelujah. <coughs> are, we, are we there? Oh, back. back. <laughs> well, we'll get there. I was going to show it to you. He's dealing with, in chapter 6, the first eight verses, he's dealing with the church suing each other. Now, I'm going to tell you something. We live in a society that doesn't want to be told it's wrong, that doesn't want to deny itself, 
that doesn't want to repent, that doesn't want to submit ourselves one to another, doesn't want to have anybody tell me I'm wrong. Hello. Don't listen. And, and listen, if the pastor brings a judgment about something, they pack up and leave. If they don't like the answer. We're just, it's just ungodly. That's ungodly. Paul writes here, he says, look, dare any of you. I mean, it's kind of like this. How dare you? Having a matter against another, go to the law before the unjust. And not before the saints. We should be judging these matters in the church and not before a court. <coughs> Are you here? No, we go out there, we, we, we lay all our stuff out there to the world. Instead of, you know, I got a dispute in the church, and uh, you come to the pastor or the elders of the church and say, this is what's going on, they judge it. And you actually live by the judgment. Hello? Are you here? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall judge, be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? In other words, disputes among ourselves, we should be taken care of in-house. I said disputes among ourselves, we should be taken care of in-house. Shouldn't have to go to the courts. We should have so much respect for the counsel and wisdom of our, of our pastors and leaders that when they speak, we believe they're speaking by the oracles of God, and we submit and yield to that. Now, I'm not talking about shepherding and discipleship where they tell you you can't go on vacation this week. I'm not talking about the crazy stuff, okay? We're not talking crazy stuff. All right? You know that if, you know, uh, you can't eat that this week because I'm your elder and I said that, you know, I have the rule over you, you can't eat lasagna this week. I'm going to double up because that's, that's not a place you have authority. Okay, it's in spiritual and moral matters that are in line with the Word of God. And, we bring, and only when we bring that, I just don't go up to somebody and say, hey, you know what? You, you're not to go on vacation this week. That's, that's, you don't have to get approval. And there was a whole movement called the Shepherding Movement that did that kind of stuff. They had elders in the church, and they all, I mean, people were such captive, they couldn't, they couldn't hardly breathe without finding out if it was all right to breathe at, at a 60-minute pace or 80-minute pace. I mean, it was terrible. It was crazy. So we're not talking about that, but we are talking about trusting the church to be able to judge matters. Hello? I'm walking in love. I'm telling you, folks, there's a lot of stuff that we do in the church that we, everybody, everybody wants to talk about walking in love. I am telling you, there are people who, who holler, I walk in love, I walk in love, I walk in love, and then when the rubber hits the road, they don't even come close to walking in love. And see, those things should be able to be judged by the church and say, you're not walking in love, now repent. It's hitting right. Your, your actions aren't right. Well, the Lord showed me. I'm, I'm tired of people telling me the Lord showed them stuff outside the Word of God. God doesn't give you a special pass on doing, not doing the Word. I heard people say this. The, the, God showed me I don't have to be the devil's doormat. Yeah, but you've got to submit one to another in the fear of the Lord. And you've got to uh, prefer your brother above yourself. You can call it what you want to call it, but the Bible says do it. Now, if y'all don't get any more enthusiastic, I'm going to preach it three times. I'm just going to keep repeating it until you get excited. Amen. You know, I've just seen people who always want to give themselves a pass instead of, you know, doing what the Word says and, and trusting the leadership to speak. And when the leadership speaks, they repent and they do it. Amen. Know you not that we shall judge angels. How much more th uh, things that pertain to this life? In other words, in this life, the church should be judging internally disputes. It's not new. When Moses was running Israel, they had to set up 70 judges to help him because he couldn't handle the load of all the stuff that was going on. They had to settle their own stuff. Now, we're not talking about Shia or law or, you know, the, you know, this is binding in a legal system. We're talking about people who are submitted to the Word of God, submitted to spiritual authority, who respect that, and, and are willing to accept that they're wrong occasionally. Hello. I've had people leave this church more than one, because they wouldn't, they wouldn't straighten up. And when I preached something they didn't like, they, and, and they, it went crossways with them, they went look somewhere else. I, you know what, folks? You're going to have to stop looking somewhere else and do what the Word says and grow up. Because all that does is set you back, because you'll go hide somewhere for three, four, five years until that, that thing pops back up again, and it'll pop up. 
I had people years ago get mad with us about stuff and walk out of here fussing and go find something. Oh, they were all excited. They all left and went over to this church, had them a pastor after Jeremiah, who was a pastor after God's heart, who gathered all the sheep that Pastor Ed had scattered all over Greensboro. The only problem was he was sleeping with the women in the church. He was pastoring them all right. Come on now. Got caught by the people that went to this church in his office at 2 o'clock in the morning. They get up in front of the church and tell the whole church. They had a special relationship. She was his worship leader, and they, you might see them together a lot. I'm talk, you talk about trying to just paint the picture while you see them riding around. I saw them riding around town together, him in the front seat, the worship leader in the front seat, and the wife in the back. <laughs> That's right, Janice, Janice would drop him. Both of them. Then ask the Lord for forgiveness. Yeah, tell, tell the whole church we have a special and unique relationship. See, that's, that's because people don't, don't respect authority anymore. We have got to get back to respecting. Paul's saying don't take this stuff to the world. It should be taken care of in the church. Amen? Verse 4, if you didn't have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are the least esteemed in your church. I speak to your shame. Is it, not, is it so that a, not a wise man among you no, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren? Hello. But brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because you go to the law one with another. Why do you not rather take... Let's see here, Paul says this. Now here's the interesting thing. He brings it back from not just not only going to the law and keeping it in the house, but can't you just rather take the wrong? Hello? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? That's what he says when you don't do that. Nay, you do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. Now, look what he says here. He went from just rebuking them for going to the law and not just using the church to deal with stuff, to the fact of, you know, as Christians, we're going to have times we just take it. You're not going to be justified to men. You're not going to be justified before men. You're not going to be, you know, whatever. You're just going to have to take it and be mature and walk in love and forgiveness. Everybody say, ay, ay, ay. All right, let's do a little friend and say, ooh, la, la. <laughs> Let's be American. Oh, my word. <laughs> Hallelujah. So he, 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 so he rebukes him for going to the world and not keeping it in the church. And then he even goes further and rebukes them in the church for not just taking it. Not just going ahead and suffer the wrong to keep unity and peace in the church. Say amen or oh me. That's pretty strong, isn't it? We have not matured in the body of Christ like we should. We have to be right. We have to be justified. We can't deal with the image of being wrong. Hello? There's things that happened in our church over the years. If people had just repented to one another, took something, took the blame, I'm talking about you know, nasty stuff sometimes. We could, have, we could have done a whole lot better. We got people who claim to be, we've had people who claim to be mature, claim to walk with God, and would not do right. And left the church in time because they, they, they couldn't handle. You know, so you, can go some, you, can go some, you can always go somewhere else, and everybody thinks you're hunk of dory, whatever, whatever, you know, because you, you think you left all your baggage over here. We shipped it over. I called UPS and have it overnighted. When I found out where you were, I shipped it. So you didn't leave it here. It's there with you. It's in the cloakroom. Hello. We ain't keeping it. It's yours. Amen. We have got, you know, just, he says here, why do you not rather take the wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, you do wrong. And defraud and that your brother. You know, you're defrauding your brethren by not taking that step up and walking in love and walking in a higher place. And listen to this. I can tell you something. I learned this lesson a long time ago. As long as you're waiting to be vindicated, it won't happen. 
when you forgive and release and put it in God's hands, he can vindicate you in the right time. I know that by experience. We have to be people who walk in love. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, now, now let me say here, he's going to shift gears here a little bit. From judgment within the church, and he's going to move back over into a defilement in the world. So, before we, so as we're leaving this judgment thing, <clears throat> Paul kind of shifts gears. If we're going to grow and reach our potential as a congregation, we're going to have to take some stuff. If I didn't take some stuff, I'd been gone a long time ago. I've taken some stuff. Hello? You just, you just got to, there's things you're going to have to live with. And just give it to the Lord and let the Lord work it out. And it may not get worked out for 30 years. It might not get worked out until we all get caught up in the sky together. But there's things more important than your feelings. Hello. And so we, we're going to have to take some stuff. There's going to be people who come in and do stuff and say stuff and whatever else stuff. Now, if, it's, if, you know, if we bring it to the church, the church can judge it. But on the other hand, if, you're, if, if we do some, if we have to receive things and walk in things, okay. Amen. There's people who should be here right here today, but they got over into this place. And I'm not talking about one person or two. I'm talking about numerous people. If they had done this, they wouldn't have gotten so offended they had to leave. But they got so offended they had to leave because they couldn't do this. They couldn't, they couldn't even come in the same room with their brother or sister in the Lord without having blood pressure problems. That's just not right. And if you're listening on the internet, you're watching me, I'm sorry, I love you, but you were wrong. Because you should have been mature enough to, even though there's a conflict, to sit together and, and, and go past that thing. And don't think you're over it because you're not. You carried it with you. Like I said, we shipped your, we shipped your baggage to wherever you are. Hello. What if you don't know where they are? It's over at the UPS holding tank place. It ain't here. <laughs> it's, the church must reach the place that we can get past interpersonal junk for the betterment of the kingdom instead of being held back and hurting the kingdom because we, 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 have to, we just got to defraud our brothers so we feel better. You're not going to feel better. You know, sometimes justification doesn't make you feel better. Being right doesn't make you feel better. Sometimes you hate being right. You ever been there? Ever hated being right? I'm talking about interpersonal relationships. You know, you know some of these things, there, marriage is one thing, interpersonal relationships in the church is another. There's all kinds of things that go on. And see, that's why the church, and that's where if there is a conflict that can't be resolved by one taking this out, the church should come in and judge it. And it should, you know, instead of just leaving it open and letting it go where. But you know what? That can only happen if you honor and respect the leadership to the point that what they say you will do and you won't just, you know, gnarl, get gnarly with them. That went over big. Well, see, years ago we had somebody in church and, and there was a, something going on in their life and we brought them in and said, look, you, you know, my wife is getting this from the Lord. And they got mad with us. And went and told somebody out to the church later, said, well, I'm doing it, but, you know, and, and, and that person looked at them and said, I don't care what the pastor said. Anybody, they didn't say pastor. When anybody says you can do what you want to do, guess who became their favorite counselor? Guess who ended up leaving the church? Hello? And the wisdom and the counsel was godly. And I, I, I don't want to give you the whole back. I can't give you the whole back story to it. But I'm going to tell you that what they, we told that person, they needed to hear and they needed to do. And they rejected it because they got someone else to give a different counsel. They didn't respect what we said. They didn't, they didn't cherish the counsel that's coming from the Holy Ghost. 
They felt they were in legalism and bondage, and they were only obeying it because they felt like they had to, or they would, you know, something bad would happen to them. No, no, no. The counsel was to help them, not to hurt them. Amen. But then somebody else gave them different counsel, and Lord have mercy. When the husband preached, they were on the front row. When I was preaching, they were on the back row. Hello. I mean, they worshiped the ground they walked on. They, were, they heard from heaven. That's not, that's not how the church should be run. All right? So Paul was making statements about judgment. Then he moves in in verse, in verse 19 here, and he shifts gears. I say verse 19. Verse 9, he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate. Now, I, how can I say this? The word effeminate comes from a Greek word that is in, refer, is, is, is in reference and then abusers of a civil mankind. Now, this is, this, is, this is talking about homosexuality. It's talking about the, the male and the female homosexual. Go study out in the Greek. That's what it's talking about. The effeminate is in re is reference to passive homosexuality. You're the female. Abusers of themselves of mankind is the, is the, is the male homosexual in the, in the relationship. That's what it's talking about. So people who say it's not in the Bible, it's right there. Hello. It's also in Romans 3. And it's also in the Old Testament. It's also all over the place. Jesus didn't say anything. Uh, he said it was not so in the beginning that a man should leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. The two should be one flesh. He, anoint, he, he established marriages between a man and a woman. And he said, I did not come to undo the law. I came to fulfill it. And so that meant he, was, he, he upheld the law. The only time that the law was no longer in operation is when Jesus... Gave an alternate commandment. You've heard it, I said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, love your brethren. He gave a higher law over that. Or as when Peter had the vision and God let down the animals and said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. He said, not so, Lord. Nothing unclean has ever touched my lip. He said, that which the Lord has cleansed, thou shalt not call unclean. And part of that had to do with their diet. That was all with the dietary law. And it had to do with the ability to cook it so it was safe. A lot of your scavengers and stuff, you know, shrimp. Those kind of things have to be cooked to a certain temperature to be safe. Pork has to be cooked to a certain temperature or it's not safe. All right? And so God cleansed those things. So let me tell you something. Don't, you, don't go, go bring in a bunch of Old Testament dietary law and say you've got to eat this, you can't eat that because under the Old uh, uh, it's cleansed. I can rise like Peter and kill and eat it. Woo! Glory to God barbecued from Eastern Carolina. Hallelujah. Pork barbecue. Vinegar based. I'll make you speak in tongues. Glory to God. Okay, but the effeminate is in reference to the, it actually means soft. It's in reference to the, to, the, to the passive homosexual and then the active homosexual. In other words, the female partner and the male partner, all right? I can't, listen, don't get mad when me. ask the Bible. People just don't like things in the Bible. Are you here? He goes on and says, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now, the Bible says that the effeminate and the abusers of the mankind, nor the drunkards or the uh, thieves or the fornicators or adulterers, are going to inherit the kingdom of God. You can't practice these things and expect blessings to be on your life, to go to heaven. You can't do it. You cannot be a practicer. You cannot have a homosexual church. So also, Joe, you know, Nathan's friend that plays the saxophone, he was with us on, the vaca on, our, on spring break this week. I took Nathan and him on spring break up to the cabin. And uh, they, he showed me a, a picture. How many of you have ever seen? Now, African-American churches do this way more than white churches do it. But they have anniversary celebrations. And they always have this, this you know, picture of the, of the pastor and the first lady. It was a church celebrating their third anniversary with the pastor and the first gentleman. And it was done the exact same kind of picture and everything that you would have seen with the pastor and the first lady. Ichabod. The Spirit of the Lord has departed. Actually, the Spirit of the Lord may not even ever showed up. I don't know what the word for that is, but whatever that is, that's what happened. God didn't show up to the church with the pastor and the first eight gentlemen. And it wasn't a woman, it was another man. God says the effeminate and the abusers of themselves of mankind will not have inheritance of the kingdom of God. Let me say something. You pastors that are in adultery, living in adultery, you don't have inheritance. You better repent. Are you here? That went over big. 
drunkards and revelers and extortioners. You're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. So Paul now moves in, and once again, and listen, he's dealing with a church wholly given to the flesh. The church at Corinth was a carnal church. And he deals with these things. So when he said that, he's dealing with a fleshly church. And when we say things to our church today along these lines, well, I'm under grace. No, no, no. Paul wrote to that church. Hey, Paul understood grace, and he told them, you can't do this and get away with it. It doesn't work. You're going to have to live right. Come on. Somebody. Now, and such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Verse 10 and 11. Primo verse for the I can do anything I want to do crowd. <clears throat> all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I, have, I've been, I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly, and bellies for the meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now, the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Let me read something to you out here. <coughs> Complete biblical um, library. Similarly, that God produced this a uh, number of years ago. It's now an electronic form. You can't get it in book form. I have one of the copies you can't get. Verse 12. Paul Concluded this statement by reminding the Corinthians that the body belongs to Christ. All things are lawful must have been a common saying in the church. You know how we pick up things in the church? And they're probably just going around saying, you know, whatever they were doing. Well, all things are lawful to me. And doing stuff. You can't stop looking for covering to live in sin. As a Christian, you should be looking for the covering that keeps you out of sin. The covering of his mercy and his grace to keep out of sin. Not looking for a covering to participate in sin. We have too much of the church trying to participate in sin and justify it. <coughs> so it says here, this must have been a, a common saying in the church and certainly the Holy Spirit, speaking through the Apostle Paul, did not intend to tell Christians that anything goes. We, we see too much in the Bible against that. So that can't be. You know, Paul was a very rhetorical writer. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What's his response to that? God forbid. That's rhetorical. That's rhetoric. It's a rhetorical statement. You know, well, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And some bozo probably say, yeah! Boy, man, the more I sin, the more I get grace. Bozo. It was, it was rhetoric. It was rhetorical. Even, you know, Paul talks about one place, and I believe it's in the Corinthians letters. Um, we talks about uh, why do you baptize for the dead? He wasn't instituting baptism for the dead. He's saying if you don't believe in the resurrection, why do you bother baptizing for the dead? In other words, he was using something they practice in that region as an argument, a, a logical argument against their belief in not having the resurrection. Rhetoric again. Not, he was not instituting baptizing for the dead. See, you've got to be a better Bible student than that, folks. And so, rather, so Paul, the Holy Ghost did not intend him to tell them that anything goes. Rather, the Holy Spirit countered that slogan with, but all things are not expedient. Now, you might think everything's lawful, but it's not good for you. In this verse, Paul gave a principle of Christian liberty. Although all things are lawful, there are certain limitations. The truth of this statement is important because it deals with what is possible but not necessarily best. All things cannot be taken in the absolute sense. Paul's intent was to lead the readers to admit the truth of this verse and then later to see they're wrong. In other words, maybe you, maybe you can get away with it, but it's not good for you. And that's not, that should not be the Christian principle. And that's what he's saying here. That's not the Christian principle. How much can I get away with and still get to heaven? That's not, that's not what we're about. It's how close could I draw nigh unto God and he'll draw nigh unto thee. Submit yourselves therefore unto God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Not hang out with the devil and make it in somehow, some way. Come on, church. That's good preaching. Amen. 
If the Christian is free to do all things, he is still not free to sin. So Paul, when Paul said all things are lawful, he didn't mean that you can go out and fornicate. He just got through telling you you couldn't. You'll go to heaven. You have to read everything that we talked about. You have to read things in context within the parameters of why it's being said, who it's being said to, when it was said, what the purpose was. Not just cherry-pick something out to let you get away with whatever you want to get away with. And let me say something. If that's what you're doing, you got the wrong heart in the first place. If you're looking for ways to cover living outside the moral law of God, you're not, you're not a good Bible student. You're not a good disciple. And you're living, you're sowing to the flesh. And he who soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Amen. You're looking for opportunity to sow to your flesh. We need to be like the, the, script, the, the little chorus we used to sing it. We are the, it's, it's a scripture. But we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Why would you want to empower your flesh at the expense of the maturing of your spirit and of being able to walk in spiritual things? Why? Because you're carnal. I'm not being ugly. I'm telling you where you are. You need to locate yourself, and you need to fix that. You need to be spiritual, not carnal. It's not about appeasing your flesh. It is about it growing in your spirit and honoring God with your body. Paul, he writes, says, therefore, honor God with your body and your spirit. Actually, he, goes, he says, I think we honor God in your spirit and with your body, which, and, and, but talking about which are God's. Yeah. Amen. Verse 13, meats for the belly and bellies for the meat. Now, God has an express purpose. I'm sorry. I didn't finish the other. They're brought, they, though the, Christian, the, the Corinthians thought they were free, but their actions had brought them under the power of sin. That's what he goes on says. He says, though um, limitations of Christian, I get so far ahead of myself, I, I, then I don't want to go back and catch up. Let me go back. Paul's intent was to lead the readers to admit the truth of this verse, and then later, I'm not going to go past verse 13. I'm going to stop there tonight. See, they're wrong. If the Christian is free to do all things, he is still not free to sin. Limitations to a Christian's liberty are set by consequences and what is right. Now, like we said this morning, if you are repentant, when you have crossed the line, when you have sinned, when you've made the mistakes, God will give you mercy and grace. But if you set yourself that I can do whatever I want to do and keep living that way, you're going to have some consequences you don't want. Because the wages of sin is death or destruction. Also, the possibility of being brought under the wrong power would limit the sentiment expressed in this verse. In other words, if you, if he says here, remember, the, you know, know you not whom you yield your members to, who you, you yield to? You were members under unrighteousness, or Romans 6, or unto righteousness, you are the servant of that? So if you yield yourself to your members to sinful things, Paul writes in Romans 6 through 8 and says, you're brought under the power of that. So the sentiment of the verse, all things are lawful to me, cannot mean all things are lawful to you in the sense you can do whatever you want to do. That cannot be the express meaning of that. Because Paul right, later writes and says, you're brought under its power. Yeah. If you yield your members as service of unrighteousness, you will be brought under the power of unrighteousness in your life. Did, did, did I, am I hearing that the thrill is gone? The Christian shares the authority of Christ, but that does not give freedom to do all things, even if the right to do them is there. Even if the right was there to do them, you can't do anything. Verse 13, he says here, uh, meats for the belly, bellies for the meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not fornic for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. God, and I've heard people use this, you know, anyway. God has an express purpose for the body. It may well be that the Corinthians had placed fornication on a morally indifferent level, arguing that the presence of bodily appetites was enough reason to gratify them. Just because you've got a bodily appetite don't mean you can gratify them. Perhaps they considered body and soul separate, and since the body was to be done away with, it made little difference what it did. Paul quickly demolishes this viewpoint. Paul admitted the fact that there are certain natural appetites, but regarded them as to, this, to a peculiar, 
particular sphere because they are passing. In due time, God will render them inoperative. But now, what you eat, you're not you know, eating and eating and stuff. Let me face, say something, folks. Eat, going out and eating a T-bone steak, eating, drinking a cheer wine slushy. Anybody ever had a cheer wine slushy? Yeah, eat that, blah, blah, blah. Glory to God. I like a cheer wine slushy. But the Bible, the Bible he's going to render them inoperative. What you eat and all that stuff ain't going to matter. Okay? But that doesn't, you know, that's a natural appetite that you have, to, you have to take care of food. Now, you can't do it in excess. We'll be temperate in all things. But that doesn't mean that you can be temperate in fornication. Okay? That's not what it means. Because it comes right behind that and says, now the belly is for the meats and the meats are for the belly. But it goes on and says this, what? Now the body's not for fornication. You're being judgmental saying that I'm, it's wrong for me to fornicate. No, the Bible says that it's not for that. Now you can call me whichever you want to call me. I really don't give a rip. If you're going to reject the word of God, that's your problem, not mine. You're being mean. No, I'm being straight up. It's time we stop Mickey Mouse around people and their little, little statements and their little manipulative statements to try to keep everybody from saying, I'm doing wrong. If you're doing wrong, you're doing wrong. The body is not for fornication. Well, pastor, you know, we're under grace. It doesn't matter if we fornicate. Yes, it does. Your body is not for fornication. Hello. Let's move along. Paul admitted to the fact there are certain natural appetites, but relegated them to a particular sphere because they're passing. In due time, will God will render them inoperative. But the body is not to be done away with, nor is fornication, etc., transient. It has a permanent effect. Likewise, the connection is not between the body and fornication, as with meats and belly, but the body and the Lord. God did not design, listen, uh, Tyndall's New Testament commentaries, Morris says, God did not design the body for fornication as he did the belly for food. They're not on the same thing. They're not equal in uh, regulation. But you can eat food, buried or unmarried. Old or young. Hello? The belly was designed for food to go in and be de dealt with and processed in your body. Fornication in the body were never designed for one another. See? And that's, that's his argument here. Yeah, you have, and so he's, he's talking to a very carnal church, and they're probably just thinking, well, you know, it's a natural appetite. I had the right to gratify that, that, that appetite. Now, we're to control our bodies. I said, we are to control our bodies, and it's a, nece it's a necessity. Everybody say, it's a necessity. The body, the physical part of man, belongs to God who created it. It is to be treated with honor. It is for the Lord and needs his help to function properly. Amen. Let's me go ahead and read the rest of this. I'm not going to cover all this. And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? So shall I take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? God forbid. Here he is again. God forbid. What? Know ye not that he is joined to a harlot is one body, for two saith he shall be one flesh. But he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Now he's putting you to a dichotomy here. You're saying you're a believer, you're joined to the Lord, now you're joining yourself to a harlot in the physical. And your body's supposed to be honoring God. And it's not the same as you eating food. You're not dis the only time you're dishonoring God and eating food is when you're gorging yourself. Hello? And you got to go get your stomach pumped out because you put so much in. You can, I mean, it's just too much. You know, when you walk out and you, your belly went from here to here in one meal, that's wrong. Amen? Y'all hear? When you gorge yourself, that's, that's, not being, that's not being temperate. But fornicating is never right. Eating is normal. Eating temperately is normal. Fornicating is never right. Flee, verse 18, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? And I, I know these gracie people sitting out there going, well, I'm under grace. You don't, I'm you, just read your Bible and stop reading it with that prescription glasses of I can do whatever I want to do and get away with it. Read it with an open heart. He's very clear here. He just said that earlier. 
about that whole thing about, you know, all things are lost, but not all things are speedy. And he slams it now. He comes back and, and dresses it down one side and down the other. Amen. Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not ooh, your own. You don't have the right to do whatever with your body when you want to do with your body as a Christian. Why? For you're bought with a price. Therefore, here's how he concludes it. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Yeah, you're right, Jerry. That's plain enough. You can't get much plainer than that, can you? You're bought with a price. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Now glorify God in your body. That's commandments. That's the law. I'm out under the law. Don't be a pinhead. Don't listen to the talking points of people who are, who are prostituting the gospel to make money because it's popular and makes it easy, and people love it when it's easy. Why do we eat out so much? We'd rather pluck down the bucks than go home and do the work. Let's face it. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about now. Some of y'all already decided when you came tonight where you were going on the way home. Why? Because if you go home and cook, you've got to get out the frying pan, you've got to get out the saucepan, you've got to get out all the food, you've got to do all the prep work, you've got to get it cooked, you've got to sit around and wait for it to get cooked, then you've got to serve it, and then you've got to clean up all the dishes, and you just rather go spend that extra, you know, 45, 50% on that meal so you didn't have to do any of that. And there are Christians who would rather pluck down the bucks to somebody to tell them what they want to hear than be students of the Bible and be doers of the Word and live according to the Word. And they feel better because somebody's told them it's okay. Now, if y'all don't get any more excited, I'm going to just start over and preach it again. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. So Paul went through the first eight verses and talked about judgment. Then he came right back into this after the fornication chapter of chapter 5. We dealt with the fornication and judged the guy and came back and started talking about uh, how that people are to deal in, 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 in with sin and how to deal with it in their bodies and how to deal with it in their life. Amen. Hallelujah. And um, the, the, the defilement of the world getting into the church. We can't have that in the church. But how do we get rid of it? By honoring God with our bodies, glorifying God with our bodies. Hello. Now, I just I know of a church. I just heard about a church. Pastor just got, came, the bishop came in and, st and sat him down, stripped him of his ordination and everything in front of the church because he'd been in adultery and come to find out he'd been married for 45 years and I was 45 years he's been in adultery 35 now I don't know why it took them that long to figure out he wasn't doing right somebody should have known something before then and he should have been in a church discipline 43 years ago when they found out the first had to, somebody had to have known there's no way you hide that, for, hide that kind of stuff from church to church and it never get back to somebody. But you can't fear God and live. I mean, now listen, I'm going to tell you something. I know people mess up. And I know people make mistakes. And I know they get caught in certain circumstances. They shouldn't and they should be doing this. But when it's a pattern for life, you have no fear of God. You have absolutely none. Not even an ounce a fear of God. Can't. Let me say, it. having a fear of, of, of judgment and a displeasing God should keep you from doing any of these things. But we got, we've gotten so loosey-goosey in the church. Well, I, I mean, I can't lose my righteousness. I can't lose my salvation. I can do anything. You know, praise God. Praise glory to God. I get the best of both worlds. I can have a harem here on earth and go to heaven. Glory to God. Now, I, I can tell you, what, if you've got a wife like mine or, Jan, or Jerry's, you'll get to go to heaven quicker than the rest of us. We get, we get to go quicker. Yeah, we, we get to go, that's right. My wife told me when we first got married, now she's Cherokee. 
Uh, her great-grandfather was full-blood Cherokee. We wish he had signed the roll book. He didn't sign the roll book, so we can't get the money. <laughs> Nathan, all my kids would have gone to school for free if they had signed the roll book because they got enough Cherokee in them to, to get all that money, but they didn't sign the roll book. That would been a lot of money. <laughs> Hallelujah. But she looked at me and told me, because see, in the Pentecostal church, they'll forgive you for adultery. They won't forgive you for a divorce. If you, if you divorce your wife, you can't preach them, I guess. But if you, you have 35 years of affairs, you can keep preaching. Hello? She told me, she looked at me and said, if you ever cheat on me, I'll kill you. Now, I wouldn't have taken her so serious, except she had on a headdress, war paint, and a leather outfit, and a tomahawk. I'm just joking. <laughs> Thinking about it, she's going to split my hair. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. We're going to stop here. We're, we, we finish this. Do you, do you see Paul is very strong about how we conduct ourselves as Christians?